Hey guys, Mr. BXRP here and welcome back. Today is October 15th of 2020 and I just completed the second day of swell and I am going to go into it with you uh, just like I did yesterday. So I'm going to be rifling through notes and reading things and it's going to be clunky but I'm going to give it to you the way I wrote it down. Uh, things move fast in uh, in that uh, in that program so you know I do the best I can but uh, let's just jump right into it XRP is down uh, looks like 3.33 percent at just over 24 and a half cents and the market cap is 364 billion Bitcoin sitting at eleven thousand three hundred and ninety two dollars Ethereum is at three hundred seventy five dollars tethers holding firmly at a dollar and XRP is just over 24 and a half cents. Uh, any big winners? Eh, Bitcoin Cash is the only one that's up over the last 24 hours at $261.04. So that's the market. Let's uh, let's jump into Swell. So Swell Day 2, okay? So let's go into it. Um, it opened up with uh, a keynote uh, speaker. So, so essentially, Monica Long, who's the GM of Ripple X, she had Sheila Warren who's from the World Economic Forum, and they did a fireside chat at the World Economic Forum headquarters. They actually did it outside, um, right outside the World Economic Forum building. It's a beautiful building and social distance. I mean, they were like sitting like 12, 14 feet apart, um, but but it was a really nice setting. And, um, and so Sheila Warren talked about Ripple being part of the digital currency group at the World Economic Forum. So they have a group there, a consortium of, of different companies that they talk to. Um, she said that the WEF is interested in, in, in DeFi um, with digital assets and all other digital asset use cases. Um, they help to educate lawmakers. Um, essentially, the way I grasped her explanation was they, they, try, to, they try to act like the middleman between FinTech and the government is essentially what they like to do. So so take the information from the fintech companies and help educate the government so they can, uh, or the government individuals so that they can understand what's going on, what the fintechs are doing and how things work. She said they were exploring the use cases for stable coins, CBDCs, and all were under consideration. Financial inclusion was very important to the uh, World Economic Forum. Um, let's see here, Sheila said, she was for global use um, of, of digital assets. She said regulations were, were important. And one of the biggest challenges she had mentioned was digital identity. Um, it needs solving. So apparently there's a big issue with digital identity. And, uh, and, and, and she brought it up many, many times. As far as, you know, I guess it's KYC and AML. Um, know your customer and anti-money laundering issues for companies, but I think that's getting solved. I think Pay ID is solving it. I think Greg Kidd has a company called Global ID that may be solving it. I think there's companies out there trying to solve these issues, so I think that's good. She also said financial inclusion is key, and um, and uh, including remittance and digital wallets were very important for the world. And global inclusiveness. I'm telling you, if there's one overriding theme of this year's swell, it's inclusiveness. It's 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 being inclusive to the world. And after I saw another um, speaker today, it really drove the point home to me why it's so important. And I'm going to share it with you shortly. But but through this entire two days, being inclusive was just brought up and brought up and brought up and brought up. And, um, and I'm going to talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, so, so let's see here. Uh, another note I have here. Let's see. Most, okay. Uh, most governments will never. Okay. So here's the, here's what I gathered after hearing from the World Economic Forum. Here's my gut. This isn't what they said, but here's my gut is most governments will never move fast enough for technology companies. I mean, they're just, these tech companies move too fast. That They want to move fast and break things. They want to make things happen and deal with governments later, but they can't, especially when it comes to, to dealing with money. So it's just not an option. Um, but, uh, but I know that's one of the biggest frustrations, obviously, with Ripple and other companies, I'm sure. Okay, so um, then there was a um, there was a piece on regulatory outlook, and the host was from Accenture, and his name was Kwasim 
Mendeg, and I'm sure I said that wrong, but I, I apologize. Um, Peter Kirsten from uh, European Finance was there. Kirsten Smith from Blockchain Associates, which is a U.S. company, was uh, the Blockchain Association, I mean, which she's very interesting, and that's an interesting association, and they're out of the U.S. And then Angela Itzak. Kawitz from ENS Africa, and I think she's out of South Africa. So a um, couple things I got out of this. Not not they, they talked about a lot, but I'm just going to give you the highlights. So so Peter's points were there's a lack of clarity, and that lack of clarity causes fear um, to to fintech companies and, and to potential customers. Uh, so so he was spec he was specifically saying the lack of clarity is a real problem. He said. Europe, and he works for European Finance, I guess, department. He said Europe is trying to decide which cryptos are currencies, and they have more of an approach that is regulate in as opposed to regulate out. And he felt like the U.S. was too much um, enforcing, not regulating. So, so, so the U.S. is regulating by enforcement as opposed to by rules, which I think he's 100% right. That's what we're learning day by day, right? So... Um, then Kirsten Smith from Blockchain Association said the U.S. is making some progress uh, with regulations, and she cited the OCC. Um, she said regulators need to figure out what bucket each asset fits in. Um, but overall, she seems optimistic in the direction we're moving in. Okay, But everybody seems to agree that the U.S. is moving slower than everyone else. Now, on to Angela from uh, ENS Africa. She said there's a lack of regulation in South Africa, but the central bank is moving along, sounds like, swiftly to me. Um, she says they don't follow the Howey test like the United States. A lot of, apparently, a lot of countries kind of follow along with what the United States does. She says they don't. They kind of follow more along what Europe does um, and Europe's approach, and they're more concerned about the function of an asset. So she's, she was very very, very smart lady. And she said they really look at assets independently and what they're going to do. Um, and she said her central bank is very forward thinking. So overall, on the regulatory outlook, no surprise to me or you guys that U.S. is, is seemingly behind and needs to catch up. Um, and, and look, we are behind. I mean, you know, so until we make announcements, we're behind. So bottom line is that there's no doubt. Uh, then they moved on to an award. It was Matchmaking Connector Award, and they gave the uh, Marcus Treacher gave the Connector Award to Sentbe S E N T B E. Uh, they're a Korean company that does payments. They have 25 corridors. They say that their product is 90% cheaper than banks in uh, I guess in money remittances, and uh, and they got the award. So congratulations to them. Um, okay, so this one this one was a real eye opener for me. Um, it was it was fintech and financial inclusion. Okay, so there were there were two people involved in this one. There was Laura Tyson from UC Berkeley, and she's the professor uh, professor of the School of Business, and then Jada Odin McKenna, who's from a from from an organization called Mercy Corps. Which man, thank God, there's people like her doing the things that they're doing after hearing her story it was fantastic listen when ripple releases all of these things i am gonna specifically tell you guys to go to this one watch this one because it's a real eye-opener so let me give you the high the high points here so laura laura Ty tyson from uc berkeley was very bullish on ripple as a company now now look ripple gave them a grant um so so to you know to to help um uh, uh, to help with the um, research for digital assets. And, and she said that she asked Ripple, why are you giving us this money when they originally gave money out to all of these universities? And I don't know if it was Chris Larson or if it was um, Brad Garlinghouse who told her that they wanted the smartest minds working on these solutions. So I thought that was amazing. But her quote was, Ripple can transform the process of economic development. I mean, she just said that. I mean, that was fantastic. It was one of the most bullish statements I heard from the entire Swell uh, uh, presentation for two days. Um, she says, poor companies were hurting from the current event. Uh, they need far more inclusion for, for poor people and women around the world. And she said, trust and costs in transactions are the most important thing um, when it comes to instituting a new technology. 
and and she emphasized that Ripple is a major force. Uh, so she was so strong on Ripple. Now going to Jada Auden McKenna from Mercy Corps. Mercy Corps works in 40 countries helping build communities and has 6,000 team members. And essentially they help economically depressed areas with whatever needs they might have. And, uh, and I will tell you that after listening to her speak, I think we all take our lives for granted and we're so fortunate. Uh, the fact that you can hear my voice on your computer or on your phone means you're fortunate. Um, and, and we often don't take time out to, to remember that. And after hearing about how many people don't have access to phones and money and, 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 and it's just, it's, it's, it's unfathomable, you know, to us, but, but it's out there and it's real and it's happening and I wish it would come more on the forefront. But she goes on to say, uh, the gaps in inclusion for financial inclusion are massive, things that we can't even imagine. Um, so, so they need financial access for people in remote and economically depressed locations. She talked a little bit about, I think she mentioned, you know, having some sort of phones, but not smartphones. You know, I can't help but think that Starlink is going to be involved, you know, because they'll be able to deliver um, Internet to places that don't have Internet. And if, the, if we can get phones, if we can get cheap phones in the hands of these people, and she said that they live in villages, um, and, and she didn't want to call these neighborhood slums, I guess there's another name for them, and I apologize for not remembering, but, but they don't call them slums anymore. There, there's, a, there's a more politically correct name, and I, and I apologize. I don't know what it is, but there are incredibly economic depressed areas around the world where people need access to money. And if we can have easy access to money, they can probably have family members around the world send them money instantly. And the other thing is, people like you and me might be in a better position to help help them. You know, I mean, you know, how easy would it be for someone in Europe or someone in Asia or someone from the United States to just send five dollars to someone who lives in a massively economic depressed area and maybe make their month? I mean, it's amazing what could potentially happen in the future and how people around the world can help economically depress people around the world. So that was a pretty moving um, piece for me. I, I've got to tell you, it really, really moved me. And, um, and I've got some more news about this Mer Mercy Corps that I'm going to share with you once I'm done with my swell recap, which, which just thrilled me to read this morning. Uh, but we'll get to it in just a minute. Then they had a customer flash talk, and, and they, had, they had three different customers. They had uh, Emmanuel de, de Cazotti from Lemon Way. They had Khan Soom Cha from Mobile Money and Hung uh, Guen, and I apologize for, for pronouncing these names, guys, from TP Bank. And they talked about their success with Ripple um, and how they're, how they're happy with their experiences with Ripple and looking to expand with more customers and, and all that good stuff. So, um, and, and, and TP Bank is a digital bank. And I'll tell you what, I went to my bank yesterday and, and they still have the door locked. I still can't walk into my bank. And, and, and it's getting to the point to where they're serving me no purpose. I'm getting ready to find an online bank to start using because... I have no use for my local bank. It's a big building sitting there and they won't let me in the door. It's ridiculous. So anyway, um, the, so these customers, they were real happy with Ripple, obviously, and, 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 and looking to expand their relationships with other people. So I thought that was good. Um, then there was another uh, award delivered by Marcus Treacher, and it was the Visionary Award, and it was given to Azizmo um, for financial inclusion, and they have one million users, and they primarily work in the Philippines, and they're expanding to Thailand soon. He also gave the Visionary Award to V Americas, who they work out of, um, I think they're available in 50 of, 50 of the U.S. states, um, and let's see here, they do millions of transactions a year and they embrace innovation. So, so congrats to those two companies. I thought that was great. Uh, then we moved on to blockchain and payments from adoption to growth tra trajectory. And James Wallace, uh, okay, so let's see here. James Wallace is Ripple's VP of Global Sales Strategy and Operations. Wow, that's a lot. Um, and he was, uh, he was the host and Alinka Grenleish was the senior analyst from Celent, um, and she, they are experts in financial service technology. Okay, 
So now I remember exactly what this was. She was obviously commissioned to do some sort of a report about the adoption and growth trajectory of digital assets. So they discussed that report. Um, uh, so she does polls and, and reports and, and, and for, for different companies. Um, let's see here. Da, 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 da. Okay. So high level people, key findings. All right. So she said that she said that really what they found in the recent report was they've crossed the chasm of adoption. The early majority was at 34 percent and nearing production was at 59%. So apparently that digital assets and, and adoption is moving in the right direction. She said the interest in digital assets is rising and James Wallace from Ripple went on to say adoption is accelerating rapidly um, and emerging markets are ahead. And um, uh, and let's see, oh, and, and, and others are leading an adoption, Latin America embracing out of the need. So, so essentially, you know, they find that that countries that are in need more than the United States because they just need payment, uh, uh, tra they, they need um, uh, small payment transfers maybe more than Americans do, they seem to be on the cutting edge of this technology because their need is greater, right? We have so many ways to get money and so many ways to move money in the United States. But these countries are ahead of us because they have the need. I mean, they really, really need these solutions. Uh, let's see what else I have here. Um, Jane, oh, James wanted to talk about the line of credit, and he said, the, think of the line of credit program that Ripple is offering as pre-funding to post-funding, right? So instead of pre-funding, you're post-funding, lowering the cost of capital. And then they went on to talk about the, oh, so, so Sheila went on to talk about, um, Actually, it was Alenka uh, Greenwich. She went on to talk about the three challenges of digital assets are one, regulatory clarity, two, the implementation costs, which I'd heard from some other people, and three was security. So those were the three main things. And then the last thing was for Swell today was the closing remarks. Gap Kim, who was the host um, for Swell, came out. He literally was out, came out for 45 seconds. He, and this is not a quote, this is just a summarization. He said, thank you for attending. Um, and he said, hopefully this time next year, we'll be holding up a glass together. So that was really the wrap. Um, you know, I personally, one of the disappointments in Swell last year was I would have loved it to be closed out by Brad Garlinghouse. Um, and uh, this year too, it wasn't closed out by Brad Garlinghouse. I mean, he's the face of Ripple and I think he's the best person not only to open it, but to close it, because it, it 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 would end on a brighter mark to have Brad come out and listen. I, who am I to to be judgmental? But I want to be honest, you know. So I want to thank Ripple for inviting me the second year in a row. I hope they invite me again next year. I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot. Um, now, as far as you know, for XRP investors who are the people that are listening to my channel, did we have any major announcements? No, guys, we didn't have major announcements. But, but we we did get some more clarity on on the line of credit that that stuff's going to get released by Ripple, so you guys can start to see some of the videos that they put out. So we're going to understand more of that. Um, what I would say coming out of Swell is my overall my overall position is this is. We're not, we're not, this isn't going to happen without the regulatory clarity. So um, Brad's not on TV and Chris Larson's not on TV complaining about regulators for nothing. It's real. We need regulatory clarity. We're, we're not moving this ball across the finish line without it. So, so that's what we're waiting for and, um, and that's where we need to go. All right. So that's my wrap on Swell. And once again, I thank Ripple. Not that they listen to my channel. I don't know if they do or they don't, but I thank them again for inviting me. Um, it's, it's, it's my honor. It was a privilege. I enjoyed it, and um, and I can't wait to go again. I want to go. I want to feel the 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 power that's in the room because last year it was so powerful to be there. I can't even explain it to you. All right, so let's move on with some other stuff. This was posted by Steve Gilbronson. He said, "Okay, here's my take on things re regarding Swell 2020." I don't need a swell conference to tell me how good XRP is. Um, uh, so his wife and I have. So he says my wife and I have sent and received money via Bitcoin six hours, Ethereum thirty minutes, and XRP three seconds. Enough said. Boom, boom, boom. That's the truth, guys. So you could say, oh my God, the price went down during swell. We're not. We're not moving in the right direction. Listen, you either believe in this technology 
or you don't. You you have to look at this and understand, is the asset that moves in three seconds going to be the winner? Does the asset that moves in three seconds have multiple companies driving its adoption? Yes. And you have to, then you have to make your bets. Everybody has to decide what's best for them. I have been here for over three years. The value of XRP is only a penny higher now than it was three years ago when I first bought it. Um, but my, my enthusiasm and my expectation of where it's going hasn't waned one bit. And that's just me. So, so everybody has to do them. That's me. Okay, Jim Hyatt uh, at Twin Pop 14 said, curious as to who is handling the custody of these new XRP wallets in the new version of ODL. Cue the poly sign whisper. Okay, I don't think it's a new version of ODL. I think what he's talking about is the line of credit program. Um, and I think PolySign is the logical person that's going to custody those funds. So I would assume so. But one of the things I want to know is where are those funds coming from? Is it from Ripple Holdings or is it going to come from the escrow? I'd like to know. So, so that would be an interesting uh, question to get answered. This was from Michael at VAL5 link. Can the world's best Sonic player now gets paid in XRP? So this goes back to um, SBI has a sponsored uh, esports team and they're paying their people in XRP, which is cool. Uh, Brad Garlinghouse was on Maria Bartiromo's program yesterday. Uh, here's the quote, China is well ahead of every country on global financial uh, infrastructure. Uh, Ripple CEO Brad Garlinghouse. So I want to play a little bit of it. I'm not going to play too much of it. Ripple, Brad Garlinghouse. Brad, it's great to have you this morning. Thanks very much for joining us. So you're it's like five minutes, guys, but I'll give you a minute. A system a, 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 in the United States where you actually see cryptocurrency and a structure for it. Explain the issue that you're referring to on Twitter, Brad. Good morning, Maria. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think what the world should really understand, certainly here in the United States, is that we are in a race with China. Uh, I think as we look back three or four years ago, there was a race around 5G networks. And I think if we look back in time today, we're going to find that we're at risk of making the same mistake again. And the mistake this time isn't about telecommunications networks and wireless networks. It's about global financial infrastructure. It's about global payments. Even this morning, I saw a new headline about how China is leaving others in the dust. I think in the race we're in, we're, you know, many countries are just in the process of getting the learner's permit. So for Ripple, we are looking at how do we make sure we can compete on a level playing field? And unfortunately, here in the US, we have some parts of the US government that look at cryptocurrencies one way, and others look at it another way. Sometimes it's used as looked at as a currency or a commodity or maybe a security. And depending on how it's looked at, it's regulated very differently. I think the Chinese Communist Party is being very strategic and is very focused on dominating this technology. I think there's little doubt that t today China is well ahead of where others are around the world. And I think we have to decide as a country and really the rest of the globe how we want to respond to that. All right, so it's about five minutes. If you want to watch it, you can go to Maria Bartiromo's uh, Twitter page and listen to the whole thing. But pretty much you get the crux of it. Um, you know, look, he's just shouting out to regulators. You know, announce regulations, announce regulations. That's what they want, announcing regulations. Okay, this was from Michael at VAL5Link, which this was, I was thrilled to see this. I just talked about Mercy Corps. Today, Ripple is proud to announce a $10 million contribution to Mercy Corps to expand financial inclusion and increase economic empowerment globally. That is a like, that is a retweet, that is awesome. I mean, these people are doing great work for people around the world who need help. I mean, that's fantastic. Thank you, Ripple. That's amazing. That should make national news. It really, really should. And I know it won't, but it should make national news. All the garbage they talk about on TV. All right, so this was... Um, this was... Um, uh, it's Chris, uh, was it Christina uh, Georgieva from, um, or Kristalina, I believe, Georgina from the IMF? How can we seize this new Bretton Woods moment to build forward to a better world after the pandemic? IMF Chief Kristalina Georgieva um, highlights three imperatives: p three imperatives: implementation, implement the right economic policy, invest in people, and tackle climate change. So I'm going to let you guys listen. To this. It's a minute and, and 20 seconds. I have called a long ascent for the global economy. A climb that will be difficult, uneven, uncertain, and prone to setbacks. But it is a climb up. And we will have a chance to address some persistent problems. How? I see three imperatives. First, the right economic policies. 
Prudent macroeconomic policies and strong institutions are critical for growth, for jobs, for improved living standards. And policies must be for people. My second imperative. To reap the full benefits of sound economic policy, we must invest more in people. Just as the pandemic has shown that we can no longer ignore health precautions, we can no longer afford to ignore climate change. My third imperative. We focus on climate change because it is macrocritical, posing profound threats to growth and prosperity. It is also people critical and planet critical. Okay, so it's great to hear from her. I love that she calls it a new Bretton Woods moment. Boy, don't we wish we were in a place right now to where all the major comp all the major or all of the countries had a CBDC and they needed to exchange it with any between each other and they needed an amazing bridge asset to do it. Wouldn't it be great if right now today was that day? I think that would be fantastic. This was from Allison at Allison Kershaw on Twitter. Dates for your diary, October 12th through the 18th IMF meeting, SDR review, 14th to the 15th, Ripple Swell Global, just wrapped. 15th, the Mount Gox. Uh, they're going to be releasing 150,000 BTC to the people who got, who got, who got I don't want to say swindled, but they got ripped off is what they got. Um, on the 19th, the IMF cross-border conference. On the 20th, Bahamas Sand Dollar CBDC Live to 26th to 27th, the B20 and the G20 meet. Wow, what a month is October, huh? Okay, this I want to show you. So, okay, look, if you want to raise your financial IQ, and I can't tell you how much being in this space has helped raise my financial IQ. Each and every day, I learn from people in the space. I learn on Twitter. I learn, I learn so much. Um, Joe and Doso, who's with Link2, did a Link2 Lunch and Learn yesterday. I'm going to play about a minute and a half because I think it's something you might be interested in. And I would implore you that you can watch these live. I think they're going to do it once a week and they will invite you to all kinds of stuff. If you register, um, I think you could, re you could register. Okay, I think the easiest way to register is to download download their app and register. You, you have to be an accredited investor to invest with the company. But you don't have to be an accredited investor to register and be invited to these things. And I think what Joe says right now is going to interest many of you, and it's how to become an accredited investor without meeting the financial requirements, and it's getting a license that's not very hard to get. So I'm going to let you guys listen to this because I know a lot of you are interested in, in potentially investing in some of these um, private companies. So I think this is fantastic, and I want you to listen to this. You can't pass either of those financial tests. You can still qualify if you hold certain securities licenses, and, and these are specific licenses. They're FINRA Series 7, um, 82, or 65. You can qualify by holding one or more of those licenses. Um, I want to um, uh, just explain here, because this is an important distinction, the, the Series 7 and uh, 82 are, are licenses that basically require you to be sponsored by and, and um, registered with a uh, an investment or a securities firm. So, you know, if you're not in that profession, you're likely not going to have those licenses. But the 65 is uh, singular, uh, unique, because you can hold a 65 on your own as an individual without being registered with and sponsored by a securities or investment firm. And that 65 license basically is an investment advisor license. You just apply to the SEC, you take qualifying the exam, and as long as you pass the exam and receive the license, you're done. And you, you know you don't have to even operate as an investment advisor, giving advice to other people. You can be doing it for your own behalf. So if you're a person that doesn't meet the income or the net worth test, and you still want to make investments as an accredited investor, um, we'd highly recommend that you look into obtaining that Series 65. It'll help you become a savvy investor, more educated, plus it allows you to then uh, achieve the accreditation. Wow, that's fantastic. I had no idea until I saw this video yesterday. Um, so I recommend if you guys want to watch the whole video, you can go follow them on their YouTube channel. Um, if you want to, uh, oh, also I looked in the Series 65, it takes two to four weeks to study for it, to get it. 
and it costs like two to three hundred dollars. So it's not that expensive. So I know there's a lot of people out there that want to invest in these companies, but they don't meet the financial qualifications of being an accredited investor. And I think this is the ticket. Okay, so I wanted to share that with you. You can also download their apps. I've got the links in the description of this video if you want to register with them to be involved in some of these talks that they do. And, uh, and I can tell you, uh, these are good people over there. All right, so I'm gonna play this video as I read my disclaimer, and, and this says 2020 in one video. <laughs> and uh, okay, guys, I'm not a financial advisor, I'm not an accountant, I'm not a crypto expert, or I'm not an accountant, I'm not a weatherman, and I'm not a crypto expert. These are my opinions only, don't make any financial decisions based on anything I say. Uh, please subscribe to my channel if you haven't subscribed by now please give me a sub please hit the like button if you like my video four other people will watch it uh, and, sh and share my video with anybody who you think might appreciate it and everyone have a fantastic day bye bye